I want to direct this to Proverbs. This is a very, for me, a very solemn and serious uh, topic. I'll call him the Christian. Because I have friends and, unfortunately, fellow pastors who do not view this the same way that I view it, and I believe I view it correctly from God's Word. They, they view this thing now called to be a, a preference. A, a preference like, like if you want to wear a tie out soul winning preference. Now we ask men to, to wear ties out soul winning. That's a preference. It's not found in the Bible, right? Just something we, we do here at First Baptist Church. And if another church did it differently, I would not think ill of them in any way, shape, or form. In fact, if I lived in Puerto Rico, I would not go soul winning in a tie. Mainly because my, tr- my tie would become a sweat rag in about 30 seconds. But here in Saginaw, we ask that that's a preference, but, but there are some who think that this, that this topic of alcohol and wine is a preference. And I would submit that this is a biblical teaching with biblical principles that I'm going to argue for that the Bible, that I believe the Bible teaches and commands and instructs us that alcohol has no place as a beverage for a Christian. Alcohol has no place as a beverage for a Christian. If you look in Proverbs chapter 20, verse number 1, where the Bible says this, Proverbs chapter 20, verse number 1, wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not, what's the last word? Wise. Whoever is deceived by this Wine that's mocking and strong drink that is raging is not, what's the last word? Wise. Do you happen to remember, you Bible scholars out there, a overall theme for the book of Proverbs that we ought to search for? Make can help me here? Wisdom, right? In Proverbs, you would, be, you would be errant of the Scripture if you did not say that wisdom was a central theme in the book of Proverbs. Starting in chapter 1, as a father to his son, chapter 2, how he's supposed to search for it and what it looks like, how it calls out. And and chapter after chapter, wisdom is presented as as the jewel, as the treasure. This is what our our goal, wisdom, and arguing that it's God's wisdom. Contrasted in Proverbs to a fool. Foolish man is never complimented throughout Scripture, and especially the fool is not complimented in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs. The fool is to be rejected, shunned, different actions to a fool, to be avoided, all right, and the foolish way to be avoided, and the wise way to be embraced. That would be a, a, a careful or quick summation of the book of Proverbs. And here in chapter 20, verse number 1, we have this Bible principle that wine is a mocker, strong drinks is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is opposite, opposite, of what the entire book is trying to teach us, the book of Proverbs. Now, do you see, you see how I'm drawing that conclusion? You see, that's what it says. You're, you're not wise if you're deceived by these two ideas, wine and strong drink. Yet, I know many people who are deceived by it. In fact, I, I would want to say that if you're deceived by it, you've missed the point of Proverbs. Unfortunately, know some Christians who have missed the point of Proverbs. Scripture for and against it. And we're going to look at tonight some things. We're going to pray for God's help and open up the Bible and, and go from there. Lord, I thank you for loving us. I thank you for the time that we have. Lord, I pray you'd give us clarity in our hearts and our minds. Lord, through your word, would you bring some truth to, uh, to our minds, Lord, to our hearts. Lord, there may be someone here tonight who has maybe been struggling, contemplating, or, or not sure here, Lord, about alcohol. I pray that you would help them especially. Lord, there may be some people here who have uh, someone they're familiar with or acquainted with who would need some truth from God's word, Lord. I pray that you would apply this and help us in each way. Lord, you will take your word and you'll help it not to return void. I pray that we'd be good soil. Help me to be a, communicate this clearly and well tonight. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. I talked two weeks ago, last week we had Brother Ramos speak for us, did a great job. Many of you gave comment to that fact afterwards, and I think that was uh, evidence of, of God working. Uh, I think I told you, I was kind of, I didn't know, it, I, when I asked him, I was really praying, Lord, is, is this you, 
for you to me have him speak, and by the confirmation from many of you whose hearts were touched, I think God was definitely in that last week. And so two weeks ago, I, I opened up this topic, alcohol and the Christian. Talked about a little bit of history about it, some of the problems in a secular setting. Right? But tonight I really want to jump in to the Bible side of this topic of alcohol and kind of open this up. There is a paradox or a, seemingly, a seeming paradox in Scripture. If you were to study this topic at all, it will seem like the Scripture will contradict itself about this topic of alcohol. It will seem that way which is part of the problem in this particular debate and this particular topic. There are, there are some passages that would lead us, if we at face value, without a proper understanding and application and a proper uh, interpretation of those passages, would lead us to believe that God is all for us enjoying wine. It would seem that way. No, but then, just as readily, you would come across some other passages where God is as equally strong against it. That is part of the problem, a seemingly paradox in this. And I think what you have to do is properly understand what God is saying and how this word is used in Scripture. You don't have to turn there, but in Psalm 104, verse 1 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord, O my Lord God, thou art very great, thou art clothed with honor and majesty. If you just slide down throughout that psalm and get to verse 13, you'd, hear that, you'd read this. He watereth the hills from his chambers. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of thy works. He causeth the grass to grow for the cattle and herb for the service of man, that he may bring forth food out of the earth and wine that maketh glad the heart of man, and oil to make his face to shine, and bread which strengtheneth man's heart. If you were to read only Psalm 104 and read through the whole chapter, you'd say, well, look at that. God made earth and he made these different things to be enjoyed by man. Herbs for men and, and grass for the cattle and, and food for the earth for men and wine to make my heart glad. So see, Pastor, God wants me not only to, to drink but to enjoy it. it. It's for me. We look at these and we're like, oh boy, I, I'm stuck. If you were to spend some time online, and I wouldn't recommend this, but if you were to go to some Christian blogs, and you'll find that, that people, as they argue for alcohol, they will just make some uh, um, illegitimate arguments. They'll grab different passages and say, well, look at this, and they'll be very, I would say, very superficial and very casual with their handling of God's Word. They'll say, look what Paul says to Timothy, drink a little wine for the stomach's sake. The Bible, the same Bible, though it seems to contradict itself, cannot be a contradiction. All right, now we need to establish a couple of things here about the Bible. We know that God cannot contradict himself. We now know that, right? God is not the author of confusion. That is clear in Scripture. All right, God cannot lie. God's not a liar. All right, so if there is an apparent contradiction, we know that that can't be the case because that is not of God. All right, you agree with me on that? God cannot lie and he cannot contradict himself. It, it, we have to believe that if we believe anything about God. All right, if, if God could contradict himself, then he could say, he doesn't, but he could say, well, you're saved, well, now you're not, or, or, or you get to go to heaven, well, now you don't, I change the rules halfway through the game. And he doesn't do that, does he? Because the Bible says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. All right, so God is not a contradiction though he may be a conundrum at times to us, a mystery. Is there a mistake in our Bible? Now, well, maybe some scribes, some copyists were, uh, were a little bit uh, inclined to the, to, to, to the bottle, and they got in here and changed 240 plus verses or 240 different places for that. Think that happened? I don't believe so. You don't believe so. All right, because the natural question, well, if they change that, what else did they change? Maybe I don't have to love my wife. Maybe she doesn't have to listen to me. All right, what else did they change? Well, we don't believe that. We believe that there's not a mistake and that Jesus is the truth and he is the word in John 14, 6 and John chapter 1. So maybe, just maybe, I would submit tonight that if there's an apparent contradiction, it is not in God's mind 
or in the Bible's words, it would be in our understanding. You see where I'm going with that? That maybe, just maybe, it's that we don't understand it properly. And that when a, maybe a Christian comes and says, listen, I don't think the Bible's against it, then maybe, just maybe, it's in their understanding of the Bible. I mentioned to you this before, but I had someone ask me for, um, a, a fellow pastor asked me for my notes on, the, on, the, on this topic of alcohol. And I said, as soon as you get me yours, I'll get you mine. I have not had his. I've got one set from somebody, but I've not had, had this other one. In fact, uh, I would submit there's unfortunately probably... If we're honest, many pastors who don't really have a study on this or have not spent a lot of time. They've read some articles, read a few passages, and, and I, I don't say that lightly, but, but um, I would say that there's a misunderstanding. It's with us, not with the Bible. I, I mentioned some of these last week, but there's some erroneous arguments out there that I've heard from Christians. From Christians. Like this, like the, uh, the Bible only deals with drunkenness. That's the only thing mandated in the Bible is not to get drunk. Now, we will work through that word or what it says in the Bible, and the Bible does absolutely deal with drunkenness. It does. All right? And it is never, it's not in a positive sense. A positive sense. But that's not all it deals with. It deals with more than that. So they'll, they'll go on to that and they'll say this. Well, the Bible basically means you can drink some, but just don't get drunk. Right? And if you talk to some Christians, they will, they will float this argument. You can drink some, but just don't get drunk. So as long as I don't get drunk, I'm still okay before the Lord. The argument, drink a little, you'll be okay. There's a, a slight problem with this argument, with this thought process, I should, I should say. Because you'll find in the Bible, as we begin to look at and study it, that the Bible um, has for wine at times total unreserved blessings from God. It'll tell us in Isaiah chapter 55 to come, and it's God speaking, come and to buy wine and milk without money and without price. It's going to tell us not to drink a little, but to come unreservedly to this thing called wine. And then it will, as we see in Proverbs chapter 20, just as totally tell us to stay away from it. It never, besides one passage where Paul of Timothy tells us, well, you'll be okay if you had just a little tiny bit. But be careful. So the Bible is giving total unreserved blessing and total unreserved condemnation for the same thing. So those who say, well, just a little bit you'll be okay, don't really know what the Bible says about it. There are some that will say this, well, the Bible is not really against it. All right, it's not against it, but I just choose not to do it. Have you heard that before? The Bible's not really against it, but I'm, I'm just not going to drink. I, again, have a problem with that statement. There are some things that I may not understand and choose not to do. But by the nature of that statement, which I've had said to me, well, the Bible's not against it. You're now acknowledging something about the Bible. You're not saying, well, I'm not sure, so I'm going to wait to study it. I'm okay with that statement. I, 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 boy, uh, I'm confused, so I'm going to wait until I know. I respect that position. But the position that says, well, the Bible's not really against it, says, well, the Bible's not against it, but I know better than the Bible. And I'm not really going to let the Bible dictate my life. I'll make my own life decisions. I have a problem with that statement. All right, if the Bible's not against something, I probably shouldn't be against it either. That'd be safe? You want me to say it again? If the Bible's not against something, I'll say it this way, then I shouldn't be against it. Okay? You know, <laughs> um, so is the Bible against people being saved? Yes or no? No. Does, does the Bible want people, instruct us that God wants people saved? Okay. Well, the Bible's not against people being saved, but I'm going to be against it. See the problem with that? I'm contrary to the Bible. All right, that's the problem I have with that. Now, I respect someone who says, I don't know, and I'll, and I'll refrain. There are times in life that we don't know. We've not studied, and we want to study to show ourselves approved unto God. But, but the one that says, well, it's not against it, but I'm going to be safe. I'll be better safe than sorry. And then button, button their suit coat and act like they're holier than thou. All right, say, so listen, no. Listen, if you really believe the Bible is not against it, then, then go for it. 
If you don't believe the Bible's against it, then knock yourself out. You won't be wise. Proverbs tells me that. And there's some condemnation coming, but uh, knock yourself out. Of course, we said this. I had one person tell me this. This helps me to relax. Well, I bet it does. I bet it does. So does smashing your head into the wall. I wouldn't recommend that either. In fact, the Bible teaches me how to relax when it teaches me to rely not on my strength, but on His strength. Not on my substitute, but on His substitution. The, 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 the Christ, right? That's how I relax. One of my personal favorites, there are some really good health benefits. One of my personal favorites. I will not answer that tonight, but I have a tremendous answer just for that argument. I will save it till the end of two weeks away or so. It is tremendous. I was so excited when I found this on a secular, all right, pagan website. A tremendous answer to that. All right? I laughed out loud in my office. Then I ran down and showed Pastor Olette. It was that good. I enjoy that argument. There are really good health benefits. If you get that, that argument between now and the time I get to that other data, I will give you. All right? There's an easy answer. We're in 2020. Healthcare has never been better, better in the world. All right? We probably don't have to go to alcohol to fix the problems of life. Just going to throw that out there, right? A few other options now. They also use leeches. They're great for health benefits as well, aren't they? Yes. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. So where are we at? Once again, I believe the key is this. The key is a proper understanding of God's Word. So let me tell you tonight, let's work in a couple things. We're going to kind of flip around a few places. I want us to understand, that, first of all, that the word used in Scripture is imperative for us to understand. Throughout Scripture, you will find six different words that are related to alcohol, wine, drunk, or drunkenness. Six different words that are used in Scripture. All right, there are two that are used regularly, but there are six different words. Of those words, alcohol and, and intoxication and wine is used on approximately 231 occasions in Scripture. I say approximately because I counted four or five times, and I may have miscounted. That's a lot of different verses, in case you, you, you wonder. All right, so if I miscounted one and I missed one or two, all right, then don't crucify me. All right, approximately 231 different times in Scripture, I have looked at every single verse. Every single one I've looked at, in case you're wondering. Um, just throw it out there. It, it took me some time to study this out. Or basically, out of 783, 137 words in Scripture, three-tenths of one percent is in relationship to alcohol. In case you're wondering, the statistic or the, or the percentage of alcohol in Scripture. Three-tenths of one percent. Of those, the major word used, if you're taking notes, you write this word down, is the Hebrew word, they say yayin, all right, it's Y-N, there's no vowels in Hebrew. This word is used 141 times in the Old Testament, translated as banqueting, wine, wine, bibber, things like that. It means wine and sometimes as fermented, an implication, sometimes intoxication. In the Old Testament, with that particular word, of those 141 times, 48 times, it is negative in Scripture. 48 times in Scripture, that word is negative. Let me give you some of those real quick, the most negative words that we're going to turn to and look at it. Let me get back there here. Turn to Genesis. Genesis chapter number 9. This is chapter 9, verse 21. This is one of those times it's negative. 48 times in Scripture, this is one of them. Genesis 9, 21. And he, that is Noah, drank of the... What's the next word? Wine. That is that word right there. And was drunken. And he was uncovered within his tent. To my best study, this is the first time the word is used in Scripture. Right here. First time. First time in Scripture it's presented to us, Genesis chapter 9, and the first time it is positive or negative. 
Well, <laughs> no doubt negative. Now there are, there are some, and, and I, there's some cr credibility to it that um, the first time something is mentioned, there's some extra special connotation to a word in Scripture. So the first time a concept is mentioned. Um, I've, I've seen some of those. I think in this one, I think the verse speaks for itself. There's nothing positive in this verse about, about wine, is there? Yes or no? No, nothing positive. Noah drank wine, this word, got drunk, and because of that, his one son, right, came in, saw his father's nakedness, told his brothers, they took a cloth backwards on him, Noah wakes up, knows what he's done, and, and he sends a curse, all right, and pronounces a curse on his, on his son and the extended family after that. First time it's used, they got drunk. Do you think this wine had alcohol in it? Well, of course, because he was drunken, all right? The context is, makes it clear. See, so you're Bible scholars out there. I love it. Turn over just a few pages, a few pages to Genesis chapter 19. Genesis chapter 19. Verse number 32. Genesis chapter 19 and verse number 32. We have this. Come, let us make our father drink. What's the word? Wine. When well, you know it, it's the same word. And we will lie with him that we may preserve the seed of our father. Of course, the account of Lot and his two daughters. A terrible account of Scripture, is it not? Terrible. Terrible. Uh, Positive or negative in this, in this scripture? Negative. Negative. And not even slightly negative, right? N not even like, hmm, I wonder what, if this is a good thing or a bad thing. I wonder if God is against this here in Genesis chapter 19. All right? No. And we see the use of it from two young ladies who already were acquainted with this beverage and its effects. So much so that they said, one, we can get our daddy to drink. And we know that when my daddy drinks, he won't remember anything and he'll make bad choices. You see that in that verse? How do you think they knew that? How did they know that? Submit something? Because they'd probably seen their daddy drunk before. I don't think this is the first time Lot ever had a glass of wine. How'd they get the wine? They're in a cave, hiding. Come on. This is not positive, is it? 48 times in Scripture, and this is why I submit that there's times when this word is used, it is not just slightly negative. Hey, you know what? Let's make our dad drink a whole lot because we know if he only drinks a little bit, it's not a big deal. Jehovah likes it, but if he drinks a lot, he'll be in sin. Then we'll get him drunk. Doesn't say that, does it? Of course it doesn't. It, it, a total unreserved condemnation for this particular account. Right? And the word used, yayin or yayin, in Hebrew, meaning wine. 48 times, 34% negative. This word is used as an offering 11 times. Neutral, 81 times. Let me tell you what neutral looks like. All right, turn to Esther chapter 7. Esther chapter 7. I know I told you to go over the scripture tonight. And here's, here's the deal, folks. I want you to know this from scripture. All right, not from me. I'm going to try to present scripture, but I want you to know from the Bible why God is against this. I don't want you to walk out here and say, well, my pastor's against it, so I'm against it. You know, I hope we're against the same things. All right, that's good. All right, there, there's some companions, com camaraderie in that. But we, bo we better both be against it because God is against it. Right, we're together in this because of God's word, not because, well, you know, brother, oh, he's a good guy. I guess he's okay. And I, I don't get it, but I'm with him. No, 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 no. You know from God's word. You have confidence from God's word. So when you, your coworker asks, hey, you know, you don't drink? Well, you know, my, my God's against it. When another Christian, oh, you're not going to drink? What? You can say this. 
In Esther chapter 7, verse number 2, a neutral, a neutral occasion of this word. And the king said again unto Esther, on the second day at the banquet of what? Wine. What is thy petition, Queen Esther? It shall be granted thee. What is thy request? It shall be performed even to the half of the, of the kingdom. Eighty-one times in Scripture, a passage like that in the Old Testament will be found. It's not positive. It's not negative. It's just telling you what happened, right? It's just talking about they went to the banquet of the wine, right? There's no other thing attached to it. It's not like there's any bad thing or good thing. It's just it's kind of like here's an account of what happened. I called those neutral in my study, all right, where it was not for or against what's going on here. And then one time, one time, there was a positive use of it. All right, now I should tell you this, there are, um, I think in my study, I would say um, probably uh, three to four positive times in Scripture that, 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 this, that we would look at this. I will get to that. Some of you submitted some questions, and they're excellent questions. Questions like, what did Paul say to Timothy? What did Jesus turn from the water? Well, what was that? We will get to that. Let me build the case about what, why the Bible's against it and answer those hard, those slightly hard verses. All right? And there's just a few. Just a few. All right? So the first word, the major word in the Bible, 34% is negative. All right? 81 times neutral. One time, you could say slightly positive. Another word, shakar, used in the Old Testament, was an intensely alcoholic drink or liquor. It is used 13 times, 59% of the time negative, a few times neutral, and, one, and two times for an offering, for an offering, and a positive time as well. Another word, mishra, that is steep juice or liquor, only used one time in Scripture, it's negative. Another word that, that is sharkar, it is to become tipsy, to, see, to satiate with stimulating drink is used 20 times in the Old Testament. Five times negative, ten times neutral, and five times in prophecy. Five times in prophecy. Sometimes uh, the Bible will talk about how God will pour out his wrath like the, the, the wine of vineyards or the, the, wine of, the wine of his wrath. That's a prophecy. God's doing this, all right, as an example. Come to the New Testament. There's a Greek word, oinos, that is used 37 times 37 times in Scripture in the New Testament. 11 times negative. All right, 11 times negative in the New Testament. 18 times is neutral. I'll show you one of those. Turn to chap Luke chapter number 5. Luke chapter number 5. Luke chapter number 5, thir verse 38. Jesus says this, but new wine must be put in new bottles, and both are preserved. All right, he's teaching, right? He's not telling us anything about the wine, just what is happening with it. That's a neutral, a neutral occurrence of that word. And another word, Methuska or Methu, um, is used ten times in the New Testament. So all in all, these words in the Bible are 35% of the time, according to my, my understanding, interpretation, in a negative sense. 52% of the time, they're just telling what's happening. We're tell, telling what is happening. There's wine from the grapes or this or that. And, and so just uh, not here nor there, not positive, not negative, just telling about what is happening. All right. And 5% uh, in prophecy, 8% in offering, and 3% that I would call in a positive connotation. I want to be clear on that. I want to be honest about, about what the Bible says. So that one day if someone says, well, the Bible says it's positive right here, you say, oh, yes. In the context, 3% of the time it's positive, and the other ones are that, that. So that's the word, words used in Scripture. If you would turn back now to Proverbs and go to Proverbs chapter 23. I want to begin to look at some of the negative places the Scripture talks about as we build this argument that the Bible is against wine as an alcoholic beverage or against alcoholic beverages for Christians. Proverbs 23, one of the most famous, I would say, passages uh, that are, is against alcoholic beverage. In Proverbs 23, if you look, first of all, at verse number 20. But the Bible says, Be not among wine-bibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh. That word wine-bibbers is that first word we looked at. So don't be around those who partake of this drink called wine. All right? That word is not inclusive of how much wine they drink. He was talking about being drunk. It was a different word that God used. So he used one who partakes of wine. 
So be not among these people. Yet, in Isaiah 55, we're told to buy it. Oh boy, we might have that, that paradox. Slide down a few verses to verse, um, to verse 29 of Proverbs chapter 23. And let's read this passage together. Look, you look at it with me. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine. They that go to seek mixed wine. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, or his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again." You know, look at this passage very briefly. We'll pick up here next week. I want to notice something, though, in this passage, Proverbs chapter 23, one of the clearest condemnations of alcohol and wine in the Bible is this passage right here. One of the clearest. He starts out the passage in verse 29, a description of the person who partakes. Woe, sorrow, contentions, babbling, and redness of the eyes. Look for anything positive, in verse number 29. Woe! Who hath woe? It's not going to be good. Who hath sorrow, pain in their life, contentions? Who is, who is fighting? Who can't control their mouth? There's nothing good in verse 29. To start this passage off, there is nothing good presented. Remember, Proverbs deal with us with wisdom versus the fool. He said, there's nothing good in here. You go on, you see the description of, of wine. It's red or causes flushing. Someone's nose turns red, cheeks become flushed. He'll use the word there in verse 30, they that go to seek mixed wine. The idea of mixed, that word mixed there means uh, that it has been now enhanced. Ah, but before you jump off too far on that, remember what he says before that, they that tarry long at the wine, they that go to mixed wine. See, the Bible never speaks of the word whiskey. You won't find it in the Bible. Whiskey, scotch, all right, um, cocktails. And God is so wonderful and, and marvelous and wise in this because he never could really name everything that humans can invent, right? We just think of some other way to disobey God. So he learns how to group some of these things together for us so that anyone with half a brain and a love for God, all right, can see what he wants us to do. He's not trying to make it confusing. He's trying to teach us here. He shows then a destruction from wine. Look at that in verse number 32. What happens when you're tarry long at it or when you even, it says, look on, don't even look upon it when it's red. It's going to bite like a serpent and sting like an adder. What will it do? It will both figuratively and in reality sting and burn. An adder and a serpent are not typically bought for pets. If they are, we think those people are strange. You typically do not let your son or daughter when they're young play with a viper. Right? This would be neat. I bought Danielle, a puppy, and Johnny, a spitting cobra. What are you doing, Pastor Howell? Do you want your son to die? No, no, no. The Bible's not against it. This is a wonderful thing. This is good. As long as it doesn't bite him a lot, he'll be okay. A little bit's okay, but not a lot. A lot can be destructive. But a few bites from the cobra, that'll be okay. Would you not think I'm an idiot? You're like, Pastor, we already do. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. He starts off by saying it stings and burns like an adder, but then he really goes to some things that, that some of us can attest to, most likely. Verse 33, Thine eyes shall behold strange women. Or can I put it this way? It will remove your morals. 
When it says, and I shall behold, it means you will consider. Where you would not consider before, you will now look upon strange woman. Do I need to go through the fact that Proverbs is against a strange woman? Do I need to break that down in Proverbs too? All right, if you're not, if you're not concerned what, or if you're not sure what the Bible says about strange women, read Proverbs, all right? Hit chapter 5 and 7, somewhere in there, all right? All right, you'll come out with a proper understanding. The Bible's against a strange woman. And it tells us to avoid the strange woman, right? Okay, yes, it does. But it says if you're, if you're partaking of this, then your morals will be in subject. It says thine heart will utter perverse things, or you will utter things that you wouldn't otherwise utter. Oh. Oh, wait, 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 wait a second. That means the Bible is actually saying that if someone takes of this wine, same word used 140 other places, that maybe it'll remove my barrier from my mouth? Oh. Well, that's interesting. Because so-and-so, when they're drunk, they're a mean drunk. So-and-so, when they are, boy, they're hilarious. Boy, they, they're doing things they would never do if they were sober. It goes on in verse 34. Ye, they shall be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea. You will lose mobility and be unsteady. Hmm. They get pulled over by an officer. They don't give you breathalyzer. They may make you walk in a straight line. And what do we know? Someone who is drunk typically cannot walk in a straight line. They'll be unsteady. They'll lose mobility. Verse 35, you'll be sick. You'll feel awful. And don't miss this at the end of verse 35. And I will, or I will seek it yet again. Addictive. See that? You go through all these terrible things, and yet you'll go back to it again. I cannot help but think of Proverbs 26, verse 11. As a dog returneth to his vomit, so a fool to his folly. See, this is, I believe, one of the clearest passages. It's real hard to get around this passage right here, is it not? You read this one right here, and God is not for this. No question about it. No question. You can't read this and say, well, I'm not sure if it's a little bit, if it's a medium bit. No. God says, in the midst of a book on wisdom, let me give you some wisdom. Here's some wisdom. Don't look on it in the cup. There's some wisdom. Because here's a list of what happens. You see, I believe the Bible is against alcohol. as a beverage for a Christian. I believe God's clear on that, and we'll continue next week. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for your word. Lord, help us to look at your word in light of your word. Lord, not in light of what we may think about it or what we may want, but Lord, what you say. In Jesus' name, amen.